And we're live. I'm so used to saying we are live. Like I, I'm like, oh, she just said that. <laughs> this is Literary Roadhouse. One short story once a week. I'm Maya. I'm Rami. I'm Gerald. And I'm an eight. This week we read the 2017 winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing. Uh, the Woman Whose Birds Flew Away by Bushra Al-Fadil. Uh, first, before I do the summary, I want to encourage everyone to take a look at this prize. You know, it's really hard to find African literature. And they, they um, put up their stories going back several years, and there's some really amazing stuff on the website. So definitely check out the show notes to look for the link to the Kane Prize for Literature. So in this story, we are following a young man who is in a bustling market in the Sudan, and we're really looking at the market and the people around him from his point of view when he discovers two young ladies, um, a girl and her little sister, and he becomes really entranced by them. He follows them onto a bus and he actually has a verbal encounter with them, and he convinces them that he's not a crazy person, he's out to kill them, and then he follows them back onto the bus again. And while he's on the bus, he's thinking about them, and he's watching how everyone in the environment really interacts with these two amazingly beautiful girls. When he gets off the bus, he's walking away, and then he sees a crowd of people shouting and surrounding um, something dangerous or bad that's happened, and what he's discovered is that the two young girls have been murdered. And yeah, let's do it. How do we feel about this story, just on a base level? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Uh, if you were, if you guys are just listening to the audio, you really need to come over to Literary Roadhouse on YouTube and watch Gerald's expressions because they're quite marvelous. So, Gerald, <laughs> tell us how you really felt. Oh, me? Um, <laughs> I think the story made me feel stupid. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, Gerald. So you didn't like it, or are you just conflicted about it? I, I'm I'm very conflicted about it. I I'm not sure what I'm what it is. I'm <laughs> not sure what you're reading. <laughs> uh, I, I I've read it four times, and I don't think I'm any the wiser. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay, Rami, you're next. How'd you like it? I thought it was decent. Oh. Decent. Ouch. I think that's even below competently written. Dang. She's brutal right off the bat. How about you, Annie's? I liked it. Um, I liked it a lot. You do have to let go of the question why several times, but I still I, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved it on every single level. Um, one of the things I really liked about it is uh, the view and the voice in the story is very different from anything else we've ever read. read. And it brought to mind a conversation um, that I was listening to on a documentary a long time ago. And it was a documentary on like great speeches and they were talking about the literary elements in black churches. Um, call and response, use of metaphor, the use of repetition and things and how a lot of those techniques go back to Africa and the African storytelling tradition. And I never really understood that. And then I read the story and it felt so different from anything else we ever read. And it had those echoes of the same, the repetition and the use of metaphors, one metaphor after another. And it read in a very rhythmic way, which all of the listeners know, I totally get caught up in the rhythm of language. <laughs> now I'm sure Anais, the one who gets caught up in all the research must have pages and pages of notes. <laughs> yeah, also, this story was very helpful with the footnotes at the end, explaining some cultural things for me. And then I kept going, I'm like, oh, let me keep looking up Suror. And then I just like went down like Sudanese music scene rabbit hole. Oh, but um, yeah, although I will say, so the first time I read it, I didn't pay attention to the cadence as much, but then you made a comment in Slack. So when I read it the second time, I paid more attention to the rhythm and I got it more this time and I, I loved it. Yeah, I think this is one of those stories where um, when you read it on the page, to me, it's an amazing story on the page. But then when you read it out loud, um, it definitely has like a rhythm to it that I just love in short stories. I think it's almost poetic in a way. Yeah, I, I can see that. And I can see the rhythm. And, and, and I, like, I like some of the rhythmic pieces within it. I, I just 
don't get it. I don't. Get, I don't understand. It's. 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 I, I've been trying to think for days. What am I going to say about this story? And 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 having read it so many times, I've got, I've gone away from my. I hate it. I dislike it. You know. I I can see elements of it which which I can appreciate to quote certain people but it's it's not much of a story to me interesting that's a pretty bold statement Gerald it's not much of a story well, um I would love to unpack that <laughs> I think it's important to note that it's a translation too and how that may affect how you're receiving it I don't know. I, I mean, the Kane Prize is specifically um, when a story wins that has been translated, not only does the writer win, but the translator wins as well. So it's not just the writing that's being judged, but the translation as well, which really puts a different spin on it. And I like the way that they've approached this. I think in a lot of cases, translations and translators aren't given enough um, I don't know, enough kudos for their hard work and the art that they're doing, because they are doing an art as well. And so in this case, because they both won, I'm assuming that the translation is just as brilliant as the story itself. Um, for me, one of the things that came to mind as far as enjoying the story, because it's not a Western story, which is what I like about it. it. It reads very different from our normal story with the rising action and the climax. and like That's a very Western plot um, that does not necessarily apply universally to all cultures. But one thing that came to mind was I was talking to a painter about um, when people are looking at his paintings and everyone tries to decipher what the painting means or what the painting is. And we were discussing the fact that sometimes when you read a painting, when you look at a painting or you read a poem, it's good to just step back and see how it makes you feel. Sometimes poetry isn't about like the underlying meaning, but how does it make you feel? So my question for you, Gerald, and for you, Rami, is, when you read the story, what emotions came up for you as you were reading? Besides frustration and annoyance. I wasn't <laughs> frustrated and annoyed. No, I, I want to make that clear. No, I, I, I definitely felt emotions. I think. No, I was referring to Jerome. <laughs> oh, okay. I think some of the unique aspects, because it's from a different culture, that it had um, very different, fresh descriptions of things like for example when the protagonist in the story was describing the woman he, he said things like her nose was like a fresh vegetable um, and a pharaonic fer, fer, neck with two taut slender cords and you know, it's just and yeah it's it's you, you don't really hear those types of descriptions that often but how did it make you feel when you read that did it make you feel interested happy yeah well, curious uh intrigued and then obviously at the end i was saddened with the discovery that the two girls had been killed no happy so yeah there were emotions there were feels gerald did this story give you any feels <laughs> did, <laughs> hey you know you know we got a millennial on the panel i gotta steal some of their lingo <laughs> Yeah. Some of their jive. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, um, yeah, I th I thought that going back a little bit. Yeah, I thought that as as Rami, Rami says, the, the the descriptions were interesting, and and made me think about what it meant. And and, and it's, but for me, the story aspect wasn't. The story was hidden beneath all this this layer of of cleverness if you like um so it, it was it was hard work for me um you know i can appreciate the cleverness and the and the clever wording and the descriptions and the metaphors and all that sort of stuff but i it's like it's like it's like our iceberg is upside down it, it's it's like all all the all the subtext is on top and the stories underneath, and and I I want this I want it the right way. That's an amazing visual, Gerald. But what else is amazing is that I asked you both how the story made you feel, and you both immediately started dissecting the elements of the story. 
So as you were reading it, how were you feeling as you were reading it? I, I, I was I was feeling frustrated and annoyed and, <laughs> and confused and because because I couldn't get to the story. I, I couldn't it, it was it was it was covered in this layer of treacle and tar and stuff and and and, and so the the story is under there somewhere i'm fascinated it's, it's, <laughs> it seems such a, a a sort of thin and simple story that there's too much too much weight of cleverness on top of it and yeah. yeah it's funny gerald says that because i i it's like i agree in the content of what you're saying but not the tone so <laughs> yes, I do think there's a lot on top. And the first time I read it, all of like all the metaphors and all the the different literary uh, devices that he used, I got caught up in them. I wanted to understand every line, like just simple things, like the 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 plump woman who, when she called her son, you could hear the grease in her in her voice. Like, oh, yeah, I was like, yeah, like I'm like <laughs> dissecting every single like metaphor and line, um, and then that does make it kind of heavy but then when i read it the second time and i didn't get bogged down and what exactly then i just heard the music of it it felt crowded and overwhelming which is what you're talking about like there's just all this stuff on top it's like a cake that's all icing and like you never get to the actual like sponge cake part of it but it worked for me because it made the the, the city is crowded and overwhelming so you feel that because of the prose and also all of this what you call like the the, the cleverness and the treacle but for me it was the voice of the narrator because that's who he is so it very quickly got across to me because like there's a way in which the way that he's constantly putting everything in relation to himself and like how oppressed he is and how his bones shake on the bus that has this like self-loathing victimization and at the same time self-aggrandizement that is kind of stereotypical of poets or we think it is right where it's like woe is me because i'm so great <laughs> like it has that <laughs> At the same time. Can I write I that down? Was, I thought it was clever. You nailed it, Annie. And I think what we all did, I am really glad I asked that question because as me and this artist were talking, we were talking about poetry, how we're taught to read poetry in school actually ruins poetry for most people because they open up a poem and they start dissecting things line for line. When most poets, if you talk to them about how you should read poetry, that first reading you should only be reading it to feel whatever it is the poem makes you feel. And when I asked you all how poet, how it made you feel, you guys responded as if you were dissecting a poem, which is kind of fascinating to me. So how did it make me feel? As I read the beginning, I felt like I was in a market. I felt overwhelmed with sens sensory just information. I felt slightly discombobulated, not sure where I was. And then as he spotted the two girls, I could feel myself like becoming more interested in these two girls and things started to quiet down a little bit. And then I was just excited. I was really excited and almost smiling to myself in a kind of like there's a joke coming kind of way. And then at the end, I was sad. So those are the emotions that the story made me feel. Now, why did it make me feel that way? I think you guys hit on all of the big things you know i like the fact that when we're in the market scene and he's overwhelmed we can feel that in his overuse of metaphor and it's like what would a poet think if he was walking through a big bustling market essentially that is what would be going on in a young poet's head right there and i thought that was really really cool and i also really enjoyed the interchange that he had with the young women when they initially are like trying to scope him out figure out why he's following them whether it's dangerous or what uh, I could really feel that and I felt like that was really the feeling around it was was realistic like women in a big bustling city especially knowing the stuff that's going on in parts of Africa you see a couple guys falling you're like what the hell and so I, I, I like that interchange between them and the way he made them feel not concerned was by revealing that he's an idiot young poet <laughs> with his overuse of metaphor and stealing lines from the greats you know I thought that was kind of awesome so you know as far as the story there's a lot going on i really like the idea of an upside down 
you know, iceberg. We're so used to seeing stories where it's a little bit on top and a whole lot underneath. The idea of a story where there's a whole lot on top and you got to search for that one little thing underneath is kind of fascinating to me and something that we don't see in our modern Western literature, I think. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's, there's, there's, to me, there's, the style is, is stopping me. So when you say, how did you feel? That's how I felt because I felt I'm, I'm not reading a story here. I'm reading somebody's writing, which, which is kind of different and, and, and it, admirable in its way. But I want a story. I want a story that I can understand first. And then I want to be able to delve deeper and find all the subtext and, and, and all the good stuff underneath. So I have a question for you, Gerald, because you said several times that you didn't really see a story there. Mm. And now you're saying mm. that the story was buried. And I want to go back to the question that we've asked on this podcast for a long time. What is a story? <laughs> because it seems like every few, I think like at least twice a year, we go back and we have to talk this out because it seems to change the more stories we read. So what is a story? In essence, I'm asking you, what was missing? Oh, gee. I feel like an English literature exam, this. Uh, <laughs> what was missing? <laughs> what was missing? Um, I... The story... Or if I can... Yeah, please. Help me out. Oh, no. I was going to ask you another question. Okay. But you're... <laughs> Why are you going to ask him another question before he's answered my question, let, Rami? Let, 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 let me answer. Let him answer. Okay. Let, 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 me answer let me answer my question. Um, yeah, a, a story is, is a story is, is 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 something that it's that the writing is about. So the you write a story, you create a, a piece of fiction. Which has characters and place and all this sort of stuff. So you've got a you've got a narrative that starts over here and ends over here. And, and for the yeah, for audio listeners, I've got my hands up. Um, <laughs> and 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 that's your narrative. Now, once you've got that narrative, then you can build the the sort of good stuff into it. And you know whether you do that as you as you're building it, but you maybe you just got the narrative in your head, you've got the story in your head, but then you're writing all this sort of mellifluous, flowing, beautiful writing. But the story is is key and underlines everything. And and I I think the guy thought I know what I'll do. I'll have a guy that goes through a market and sees two girls and then they die, and 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 then goes then <laughs> throws all this all this writing at that story. Um, and, and so you feel like the story was more about the writing than it was about the plot, and that the plot wasn't. Would you consider this maybe a slice of life type story? Oh, yeah. It's it's the the what the thing that we read, I felt was more about the style of the writing than the story that was being conveyed. Do you think that would be different if you read a whole lot of stories in similar styles? No. No, I don't. I, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I just, <laughs> I like my stories. <laughs> you like your start. You like your plot. You like your rising action, your climax, and your resolution. Dang it! <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong in that. Feel free to question <laughs> Gerald. Let's get some in there. I, no, I feel like he kind of answered it. I was going to ask how he distinguishes between a story and someone's writing, but. I think you kind of answered that. Already. Yeah, I, I, I sort of have to. I have to engage with the characters and 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 follow the plot and 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 want to see what happens in the end. And and I felt like I was. Uh, I didn't. I was just thinking all sorts of metaphors. Here. Uh, Annie, did you consider this a story? Yes, but listening to Gerald talk, I'm like struggling to okay so when we've talked about this before it's either we're looking for a plot or we're looking for a change in the character in the, in the main character right and i don't know if there's a big change in the main character by the end of it um obviously this affects him but as it changed the way he views the world not necessarily and so i agree with gerald that like the plot part of it is pretty thin 
So like struggling to be like, I do consider this a story, but I don't know why. Like I can't, right? Because I, I don't think, do you think the narrator changed by the end? I think I changed by the end, which adds a whole nother. Remember a long time ago when we did the book club with um, Roz Morris? We were just talking about her. Why is this coming up now? This is weird. And she was defining literary fiction. And she said, in literary fiction, someone changes. Either the character or the plot. But she said, or the reader. And that was one that we haven't really seen in short story. I think I'm really getting interested in stories that do not follow a regular Western narrative. Mm. And how those stories, when we read them as Westerners who are used to reading Western narratives, watching Western narratives on TV, listening to Western narratives in our music, how we respond to stories that follow other styles of narrative. The more I read stories from other countries, I remember when we first started reading stories from other countries, I think there was a story from Korea like maybe a year ago, and I really struggled with it. I was like, this isn't a story, yeah, 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 it's a parable probably or something stupid I said at the time, which is why I don't go back and read my old, read the old watch the, listen to all the old podcasts because I don't want to remember what an idiot I was and think what an idiot I mean now. <laughs> but I wonder if some of the issues that we have with the story is that we come into a story, when we open up a short story or a novel, we come into it with the knowledge of what story is based on our own cultural references and those cultural references have by and large been universalized by TV and music and whatnot because everyone's listening to what, everyone's watching Western TV. But there's all these other cultures who have, you know, centuries of story traditions that aren't based on the traditional three act structure or whatever. They're based on other things. And so I think I'm becoming more willing to just look at story as art read a story, suspend my, not just suspend my disbelief. We talk about suspending disbelief as far as like reading science fiction, but suspend my disbelief as far as what a story is and read something and see how it makes me feel and whether or not something changes, even if it's not necessarily the characters, does it change me? And in this way, I think that the story did change me because it really made me question how I read story up to things that... You know, there are stories we read in the past, I'm like, oh, maybe I didn't like it just because I was being myopic. And I'm kind of one wanting to go back and revisit some of those things. And that wouldn't necessarily have happened if I hadn't read the story. Yeah, the listening to you talk about, like, art and story and the way that different cultures express their art, it also made me think, like, maybe that's why, because even though I agree with Gerald, where, like, the plot aspects of it are thin, I don't think the protagonist changed that much. And I wouldn't even say, like, I necessarily changed that much but I still enjoyed it. And I think maybe there's a degree to which in a short story, because it's short, and we've said this before, it can get away with just being art. And it's a, it, like, we wouldn't tolerate this in a full novel. Like in six, seven hours later, nothing has changed, right? Hello, then it's Lincoln and the Bardo. No, no, you're Maybe wrong. you. <laughs> Lincoln and the Bardo was great. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, but I, I think that might be it. Like, I, I agree with you that this, to me, is art because I am getting impressions of it as I read it. I am feeling things. It is more like looking at a painting. It, I, the, the sensory experience for me, it is like he puts me there. I feel like I'm in the Sudanese city. Like I, I just, you know. So, yeah, if, if we talk, we also had this when we read um, Vanessa Garcia, this feeling of this is art, except she carried it throughout an entire novel because she's like some kind of goddess but you know, I know right yeah but you know i think that's what it is is if i just look at it as art the even though i agree with gerald that i can't really defend it if i'm like well how is it a story i don't know but it's short and it's art and that's fine for me <laughs> yeah I, I i i would i would agree with that actually and and, and the dis the discussion the way the discussion has gone but what maya says about um writing being art so yes, I can appreciate. Like modern, you don't, necessarily, you don't necessarily make sense of modern, but you look at it and you appreciate it, and, and you get things from it. So like that, I, I can see that in this piece of writing. But but it's to me, it's still not a story. Um, I 
so I didn't like it because it didn't it didn't carry me forward with the story. I have a question for you guys. How did you feel about the illustration? This is the first time an illustration has been included in a story that's won the King Prize. It's also the first time I've read a short story that included an illustration by the author that wasn't something that you know was tossed in by some New York Times author, New York Times artist, because they needed something to fill up the white space. Like it actually meant something. How did you guys feel about it? Thanks for mentioning this. And I'm going to be careful about how I say this, but... Just say it. Just it spit it out. We all say things that we regret. It doesn't <laughs> seem to be a particularly attractive woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really interesting. Okay. Um, keep going, guys. Like, I'm just like, my mind is just like, oh my god, this episode is so much better than I expected it to be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, it... it put me in the culture i don't know that much about african art but for some reason the little bits that i know picking up here and there it just felt like like you know it just put me in the culture it felt like that's that's the kind of sort of like line drawing the shape the triangle over forehead everything like that where i'm like i feel like i've seen this before and i don't know why just like through osmosis so it felt you probably saw it on um, princess Manioki. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it felt of a piece. Like it, it felt consistent with the rest of the story for me. Cheryl, <laughs> are you snickering about my Princess Marioki comment? Or are you no, just snickering? I'm, 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 I'm snickering at Annie East because it's just, she said it, it goes with the story. And I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I agree with Rami. It's not like. You know, oh my God. I think what's interesting about this drawing, okay, is that A, it's a really simple drawing, but it shows me something that Remy touched on. He said, it's not a very attractive woman. Now, it reminds me that when I watch people that have gone and lived in Korea for a while, every culture has their own view of what's attractive. I mean, and in South Korea, the thing is to have like a V-shaped face. You got like a tiny chin and it comes up and you want to have a small face. Like people will say you have a small face, meaning you're attractive. If you have a big face, you're not as attractive. And so women will go there sometimes that aren't necessarily considered attractive here. And everyone's like, oh, you're beautiful, you know, or they go there and they're considered attractive here. And everyone's like, ah, oh, you're too big. Your face is too big. You've got these cheekbones. And there's these wonderful videos of um, South Koreans, they show them um, like our models and our movie stars and stuff, and they say, "How old do you think she is?" And there was one where some guy thought Taylor Smith must have been like 40 years old because the way we do contouring of makeup to them looks old. It doesn't look attractive. It doesn't look like sharp cheekbones. It looks old. So when I looked at this picture, I was like, "Oh, this must be what they consider attractive." So when I think about like how he describes her you know, a nose like a vegetable. That kind of, in my head, I'm thinking like a Cabbage Patch Kid nose, you know? And then this face, it's very round. I'm thinking, oh, they must find a really round face very attractive. And then I thought back to like parts of Nigeria, like women with round faces and round bodies and tiny waist that's considered attractive. And so I thought this was just a really fascinating and kind of a shortcut way of, of putting me right into that culture, like Annie said. Or, or maybe the author's just not very, a very good artist. <laughs> oh, I liked it. Intentional. I loved it. Razor. <laughs> I just did a Google image search of Sudanese model, just to get a sense. <laughs> okay. It's probably going to be yeah. Sudanese models that were picked up by Western agents, so it's still Western point of view. No, you can always some. make the cultural relativism argument. I think. And that's why I, I, no, I think different cultures do have different um, do have different for sure. ideas of what beauty is. And I, I just found the drawing a really interesting shortcut way of saying this is what we consider beautiful. Yeah, but, you know, so Gerald just said that the author is a very good illustrator. OK, but he's doing this intentionally because like somebody who was trying to draw a beautiful woman wouldn't do the triangle thing where it looks like yeah. the hair is coming all the way down to her. You know what I mean? Like there's a degree to which it's a little bit stylized um, hmm. yeah he's stylizing it on purpose like <laughs> anyone trying to draw a beautiful woman would not do this right like this is just like a uh -huh. lack of talent this is intentionally this way but you don't really know that don't you? you don't know how the author you know how good an artist the author is and and whether they draw this intentionally or this is just their very poor 
you know, make, make well, I mean, think about, go back to the way that he describes the girls, okay? Because right before the drawing, he says, her round face looked like this, and then there's the picture. And then he says, her nose was like a fresh vegetable, and by God, what eyes. A pharaonic neck with two taut slender cords, only visible when she turned her head. And when she turned her head, I thought all the women selling their mashed beans and salted sunflower seeds would flee. So not only is he talking about, you know, her neck and her nose, but also the way people are responding to her, right? And then he later on talks about, you know, if you poured water on her head, it would come down her forehead like a waterfall. He's kind of drawn that in this picture. Like when I look at this picture, I see like, you know, a wider nose and like water coming down in a waterfall head, whatever that is, you know, it kind of looks like something that Miyazaki would draw. Like my previous reference, her face is really round, but it's not round in a, like I'm drawing a realistic woman way. It's round like, you know, what would we call it? Folk art, right? It kind of has like a folk art look to it. It doesn't have like a crappy sketch on a napkin look to it to me. That's what I mean by stylized, the folk art aspect yeah. of the lines, the, the perfect triangle nose. Like nobody would do a perf perfect triangle for a nose unless you're doing a certain style. Or as Gerald would suppose, you're five. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know he was thinking it, so I just had to give voice to Gerald's subconscious. <laughs> you're welcome, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. was there anything else you guys wanted to talk about about the story uh, yeah actually when he discovers the bodies at the end and he's insisting it's a traffic accident to himself i thought it was kind of sweet because we all know it's not a traffic accident and he knows it because in the final line he talks about as long as the innocent birds were struck with stones and selfish desires like he knows what this is but in the moment he's like it was a traffic accident they're on a beach like there's even other people making fun of him like what were they hit by a fish like what <laughs> you know like people sass him uh, yeah I thought, I thought that was a sweet moment yeah i think that's what made it so sad because um as Gerald would agree with me, that scene isn't particularly full of, of realistic, you know, I don't necessarily feel like I'm in the moment in that scene. It's not what in the way a Western writer would write it, but his reactions definitely were, that's what gave me the emotion because I could feel his shock, you know, that something so beautiful and so precious could be taken away so quickly. And to know that it was somebody on that bus that probably did it, that's been following these girls. Just really sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a naive little poet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it. it's more like the fantasy thing. He knows. He just, you know, he gives he gives way to fantasy a lot. Like, does he actually have a girlfriend? I don't think he actually has a girlfriend. You know, like no, that, that line. Yeah, I think the line um, where he's talking about his girlfriend, that's actually a line from a poet. Mm -hmm. That was one of those references that's actually from a, from a Sudanese poet. So I don't think he has a girlfriend. I think he was just pulling, you know, you talk to poets and they start reciting lines from different poets because, you know, they're young and pretentious like that. Yeah, but before that line, he said, <laughs> I have a, a, a girl just as beautiful as you back home every time, you know, like, no, you don't. Or maybe it's an ex. No, you don't. <laughs> maybe, maybe, that's, maybe, maybe, that's where, maybe that's where I went wrong. My, my knowledge of Sudanese poets is, is lacking, so... I think you've heard of it, but that have been a bit more. Who knows? Are we ready to rate this puppy? Yeah. Does everyone want to take a guess of what Gerald's going to rate it before he rates? I think his probably went up during the conversation. You think it went up. I think it stayed the same. I, I'm going to guess that he puts it in the two range. What do you think, Anise? Do you think he goes for twos or maybe threes? He might go to a three. I don't know. <laughs> you might go with three. Rami, do you have a bet in there? <laughs> uh, it's against my religion to bet. Yeah. But I will you? say 2.5. You think he's going to go with 2.5? Okay, okay Gerald, yeah. who won? <laughs> I like that I'm, I'm the subject of this podcast. This <laughs> we should have been the quiz. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I scored it a three. And I scored it to three at the start, and it's a three at the end. Uh, yeah, wow! I, so any he nailed it. I liked, I liked some. Of this, you know, I liked the writing. I just wanted more story. So, 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 I'm done. Oh, we love you, Gerald. <laughs> That's why you're here. Well, it's not going to be any surprise to anybody. I give this a six. 
Ooh. Yeah. Maybe it was a surprise to people then. Yeah. Ooh. I felt like the story really opened up my worldview on short stories in a way that, you know, is I want to go out and read stories that push me a little bit now. Mm-hmm. Who's next? Rami? 4.5. Okay. Uh, I'm torn between a 5 or a 5.5, but I think 5.5 because of the whole, if I ignore the like a story and this is art, I like it. Also, like, I guess like a little like how to read this advice to our readers. The first time I tried to read this, I immediately felt myself get frustrated and it's because I was tired. So I stopped myself mm. and I just went, had some tea, relaxed, came back and it was a completely different experience. So if you feel yourself getting frustrated, just put it down and come back to it later. I Yeah, I will say. That's a great I, piece of advice. Yeah, I, I read it twice. I read it once, made no sense. About five minutes later, I read it again, made no sense, and, and <laughs> metaphorically threw it in the bin. Um, but then I came back to it about two or three days later, and, and I started to appreciate it more. But, but you shouldn't need to have to read things three times to start. <laughs> I don't know. There are artists that say you should look at a painting for like an hour. Just sit there I'm, and stare at it. I'm a busy man. I've got time. <laughs> Well, I'm actually surprised. I figured that you were going to go much lower, so I'm happy. I'm a happy camper. Um, this week's quiz is on Africa. So what are you guys submitting into the bin? Uh, I'm, I'm being lazy and doing the same as last time. Laughing and Turning Away by Patrick Holloway from Good Old Card Magazine. Okay. Uh, we haven't read anything weird in a while. I'm going to go very weird. Uh, in the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka. Ooh. <gasps> yes, yes, yes. Annie, you must win. Is there some way I can like quietly like give you the answers to the quiz without them knowing? <laughs> you do anyway. Don't act like you don't. No, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, we do just to prevent your parables from getting on the show. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Ravi, are you going to submit the Monkey's Paw? The system is rigged. The system is rigged. Ravi, are you going to submit Monkey's Paw? Yeah, so... <laughs> wow! <laughs> Wait, what did you all say? That he was... Something for Car Magazine. No, 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 but what did you say before that, that you were being... Lazy? Lazy. <laughs> Yeah, so Gerald's being lazy. I'm being persistent because I think I, if I haven't already broken the record, I think I'm very close to it. That I want to see how many good. times he can submit this story <laughs> and have it not win. I'm kind of like, I kind of want to go back and like log how many times he submitted the story. The <laughs> Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacob. Okay. okay. Read it. We are, these are multiple choice. Well, there's multiple choice and true and false. Okay. And then there's a tiebreaker. So there's only six questions and a tiebreaker. This will go quick. We're going to go in the order that we are on my screen. So Gerald goes first in a second. So Gerald, yep. how many recognized countries are in Africa? A, 61. B, 49. C, 54, D, 56. Jeez. 49. Nope. There are 54 recognized countries, and then there's two unrecognized countries. Those two countries are the West Sahara and Somaliland. Mm. Anais, only two countries in Africa were never colonized by Europeans. So, of those videos, only two have not been, you know, corrupted. Hello, Gerald. <laughs> Other Europeans. By Europeans. Yeah, damn Europeans. You know how the English are going everywhere, making everyone speak English. <laughs> okay. A, Guinea and Comoros. B, Malawi and Egypt. C, Ethiopia and Liberia. D, Gabon, and Sudan. Which two were never colonized by Europeans? B? Nope, that would be C, surprisingly. That's my yeah. second guess. Ugh. Yeah, Ethiopia and Liberia. I was totally surprised by that, too. I, I figured that Ethiopia had been, you know, 
at least the French, you know, the no, French Italy are tried. Africa. Italy tried, I think. Right? Italy tried, but they didn't make it. That's why Ethiopian has such great food. Because everyone tries and nobody did it. And they used to grow all kinds of vegetables. So it's kind of a mishmash of everything. <laughs> Rami is snickering. It's like used to. <laughs> yeah, Rami, you're going to like this one. All Which right. country in Africa has the most pyramids? A, oh. Togo. B, Egypt. C, Libya. D, Sudan. I feel like this is a trick question, but Egypt. <laughs> trick question. There are more pyramids in Moreau, which is a tiny little part of North Sudan than in oh. all of Egypt. Sudan is home to twice the pyramids of Egypt. Wow. See what I mean by it's rigged? Why <laughs> you intentionally picked that question for me? It, because it was fascinating. And I'm actually going to um, have Annie's include the link to a really, really cool article about the pyramids of Sudan in yeah, the show notes. You better have so don't let me forget. Because nobody believes you. You have resources. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to go a couple true or false questions. So right now, who's one? Um, no one. No one. No. Nobody's one. Like, what the hell? No. Oh, great. Well, maybe the true false will we'll search out a winner. Yeah. Gerald. Yellow. True or false? Africa is the most centrally located continent. What does that even mean? Yeah. I don't know what that means. I don't understand what that means. <laughs> centrally located. <laughs> um. You're like the world's around. <laughs> I can just hear it. depends where you're process. standing. What do you mean? Maybe <laughs> above and below the equator. I'm going to say that. So, above and below the equator. Uh, yes, it is. Gerald is right, but in addition to being at the equator, it's also at zero degrees longitude. Oh. Mm. But it's really so arbitrary. Gerald but yeah. Yeah. has a point. No, it's not an arbitrary. We invented it's in the it. middle. <laughs> in our system of maps. It's, it's in the middle. <laughs> so, Eddie's. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 African languages. The most common language spoken on the African continent is Arabic. True or false? Hmm. True? True, it is. There are more than 170 million speakers of Arabic on, in African continent. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I, I know, right? I had fun with this quiz. Oh. Okay, Rami. Hmm. Africa has the longest coastline of any continent. True or false? True. False. It actually has the shortest the shortest coastline because there are lots of bays and edges that break up the coastline. So the of all the continents, Africa continue. has the shortest. <laughs> the street will continue. <laughs> Yay. No monkey spot. <laughs> we'll get to it eventually. <laughs> you didn't you notice he only wins when he doesn't submit monkey spot? <laughs> That's like a thing. I was debating the wig for a while. Stop, came back one. <laughs> okay, so right now we have a tie between Gerald and Annie East. So this tiebreaker is between Gerald and Annie East. Love you, Rami, but you don't get to participate. It's okay. <laughs> tiebreaker. Submission, please. Do you want to? <laughs> How many people live in the Sudan? Get the closest. What like? Right now? Um, <laughs> yeah, no right now. How many people live in Sudan? In the country of Sudan? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Pick I've, the number! Sheesh! I'm gonna say, it's a tiebreaker. I'm going to say 5 million. What? That seems low. No. Uh, but then I don't have to go much higher, I guess. Uh, uh, 70 million. Oh, great. Now you're going to make me figure out which one's the closest. <laughs> okay. It is 39.58 million. So five. Oh, really? It's less than I thought. Mm -hmm. So five minus 39. That's what? Like 
I think NIS is 34th million difference versus four, five, six, seven. I think NIS is closer, but once I have to do the math. Dang it, I figured somebody was going to get super close. You, you said, said 70 million. Yeah. Yeah. 39.58. So it's 34 it's compared closer. to 31. So yeah. Yeah. NIS. yeah so NIS won. Okay. Yeah, yep, we're going to read some just weird slightly stuff. Closer. I was like, dang it, you just went right over the top of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to so, say 60 and that felt low. So, Ennis, mm -hmm. what are we reading next week? We are reading In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka, which he describes as a dirty story, but... Uh, okay. <laughs> so, but by the way, so, yeah. I just realized that also is a trick question because now Sudan split in two, right? It's North Sudan and South Sudan. <laughs> But it's recognized country. Oh, ah, you so see, you I was thinking South Sudan, you see. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Obviously. It makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> got tricked. So that's why you got it wrong. Yeah. Hey, okay, what are we reading next week? We're reading In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka. But before you go, tell us about your city or town in colorful metaphors at literaryroadhouse.com or send us your line drawings of beautiful women on Twitter at Lit Roadhouse. Hungry for more diverse poetic madness? Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, a monthly show that discusses full fiction novels. Oh, quick plug. We read Tram 83 uh, on Literary Book, book House. Uh, we read the Tram 83 on the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, uh, and it kind of has a similar feel to this, and it's also African. Uh, and finally, we're tired of taking the podcast bus that shakes our very bones. Help us buy a podcast car by contributing at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. We're not really buying a car. Also, today's game had a lot of fun facts behind it, which we've linked to in the show notes. So check out the show notes for more. And as always, share this podcast with the girl whose birds flew away in your life. Until next time. Read a good story. Read a good story. <laughs> 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 <laughs>